Our next presenter is Dr. Robert Mace. Dr. Mace is the Executive Director and Chief Water Policy Officer at the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment and a Professor of Practice in the Department of Geography at Texas State University. He has over 30 years of experience in hydrology, hydrogeology, stakeholder processes, and water policy. Before joining uh, Texas State University in 2017, he worked at the Texas Water Development Board for 18 years, ending his career there as the Dep Deputy Executive Administrator for Water Science and Conservation Office. While at the board, he worked on understanding groundwater and surface water resources in Texas, advancing water conservation and innovative water technologies such as desalination, aquifer storage and recovery, reuse, rainwater harvesting, and protecting Texans from floods. Prior to joining the board, he worked nine years at the Bureau of Economic Geology at the uh, uh, University of Texas at Austin as a hydrogeologist and a research scientist. Uh, Dr. Mace has a uh, BS in geophysics and MS in hydrology from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and a PhD in hydrogeology from the University of Texas at Austin. Please welcome Dr. Robert Mace. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for, for being here and thanks to TCQ for the invitation to speak to you all about uh, the future of water. Uh, I'll give you the punchline up front. The future of water is actually pretty darn good, um, certainly as a profession and, and as a business. Um, some, quick, some quick stats, um, and I'm sure you've heard uh, some of these before. It's like you can go 21 days without food, up to 21 days without food uh, before croaking. Um, texting can go about seven days without brisket. But you can only live three days um, without water. And so it's, it's, as you all know, it's critical uh, to everything we do. It's, it's critical for agriculture, critical for our, our meeting our city's needs and our growing needs, critical for industry, it's critical for power generation. Um, as as um, Mishner said in one of his no novels, Water, not oil, is the lifeblood of Texas. Um, so give, you, give yourselves a round of applause for helping meet the water needs for, for Texas. We've got a growing population, so we've got to be more creative in where our water's coming from. Um, right now, we're in a, what's looking like to be a doozy of a drought. Um, yeah, this is echoes of the 2011 to 2015 drought. You look at statewide reservoir storage, it looks very similar, better, but slightly better, but similar to the 2011 um, drought. So we've got those issues, particularly if you're relying on surface water or, or groundwater that's very responsive. Uh, this photo in the back here is of uh, Spring Lake at San Marcos Springs. That's a glass bottom boat up there. And uh, this, this spring is down to about 100 cubic feet per second. It's normally at 160. Um, and, and the lake's looking a, little, um, looking a little low right now. I attended summer graduation at Texas State University on Saturday. And at the end of the, the events, the university president warned the students, because it's a tradition to jump into San Marcos River, fed by San Marcos Springs, um, don't dive in head first. You're probably going to break your neck. Um, and then the water was maybe mid-thigh in depth. Um, so we're certainly seeing impacts of drought. And that's something else that, that, that you all struggle and we struggle across the state. Um, so, so although the future is good, um, we certainly have some challenges facing us as we go forward. So this presentation, I want to uh, give you um, uh, just a quick tutorial on the sources of water. You know where the sources are, but I'm going to put some hopefully interesting numbers to those sources. We'll talk about how Texas uses water, how we th how we, where we think the future water is going to come from. I want to talk about sustainability of water resources, future trends, and then offer up some, some solutions. Um, there, there are lots of potential solutions up there. I put a question mark on there just to, to note that it's not comprehensive. Um, and I know there's a lot of things that can be done. But I just wanted to highlight a few that I, I think might be particularly promising. Or we might may see more and you may face as we go forward. 
So the sources of water, um, obviously it's, it's coming from water from the water cycle. Um, I, I don't know about y'all, but when I was in, I think, second grade, you know, we had a school put on a play. I was evaporation. Um, maybe you were precipitation. So there's about 379 million acre feet of rainfall that falls on the entirety of the state of Texas in an average year. Um, acre foot, of course, is a foot of water on an acre, about 326,000 gallons. If you think in millions of gallons per day or MGD, just divide these numbers, take three zeros off, divide them by 1,000, and you're in the ballpark of MGD. Um, so that's, that's a bunch of precipitation. Um, what, what was surprising to me when I first saw this was, look at the evapotranspiration number. Evapotranspiration, that's basically plant sweat. That's plants. Um, intercepting water generally through their root systems, um, you know, processing it and evaporating it back up to the atmosphere. Um, so in total, when you add up straight evaporation from free surface water plus plant sweat, 86% um, of what falls from the sky in Texas goes right back up into the atmosphere. Um, so, so this is a major driver um, and, and user, if you will, of um, um, rainfall or precipitation in, in Texas. Um, don't misinterp misinterpret me. I've had some folks come up um, to me after I give presentations and say, are you proposing that we get rid of all the plants on the state of Texas? No, I'm not. That would be very bad for multiple reasons. But, but just know that, a, that most of what falls, the vast majority of what falls, goes right back up. Um, so, so then what doesn't go back up um, does turn into runoff and uh, that goes to our lakes and rivers. And so about 47.2 million acre feet, um, again, runs off into lakes and rivers. And then there's about 4.7 million acre feet that's rainfall just straight on top of lakes and rivers. Um, but an interesting part of that is that 35 million acre feet flow to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, 9.3 million acre feet flow to other states, like, uh, I hate to say it, Oklahoma, um, and Arkansas, uh, Louisiana. Um, and it, so in total, about 85% of our surface flows flow out of the state. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's actually kind of a good thing uh, if you're concerned about you know, fishing down in the bays and estuaries. Um, and, and environmental needs, um, but, but there's also you know, a great deal of flow that's heading out. And then also in deliveries to other states, you know, those are, there's agreements to make sure that, that we're sharing the water, you know, just as New Mexico doesn't share water with us or Mexico. Uh, moving on. Um, and then, then there's the groundwater component. And in this particular budget, and I actually think this number's low, but we'll roll with it. Um, is that about 1.3% of all the rain makes it into our groundwater systems. Um, I personally think that's probably around three to 4%. Um, I haven't found a student to help me recalculate these numbers, but, um, but groundwater um, has a lot of water in storage, but, uh, but there's not as much coming in and coming out. Um, so an important thing to note. You know, kind of an interesting little tidbit is the Edwards Aquifer, the San Antonio segment of the Edwards Aquifer, if you take the highest water levels in that aquifer ever measured and subtract off the lowest water levels ever measured, and at those lowest water levels, Kamal Springs went uh, completely dry, stopped flowing, and San Marcos Springs was at a historic low, that's about 3% of the total amount of storage in, in that aquifer. and so. So if you're seeking to preserve um, spring flow, you just wind up being able to take a, a tiny amount of that. So that, that's our water budget. Um, and this is helpful because like, sometimes people will be like, well, I'm concerned about rainwater harvesting, intercepting water from the Colorado River. 86% um, of it goes back up. I mean, you can do those numbers and it's, it's a, if every roof in Texas, and I had made those calculations, every roof in Texas captured rainwater in Texas, it would have a minuscule impact on surface water flows. Um, so surface water and groundwater are our primary supplies, um, but, uh, but another um, up and coming or potential supply is seawater desalination. 
And the first seawater desal plant was actually down in Freeport, Texas, as part of uh, Office of Saline Water, which is now part of Bureau of Reclamation, or got absorbed into Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and so, uh, so there's still great promise for seawater desalination out of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody is doing that yet, um, but there are several projects in the Corpus Christi area that are pursuing this as a resource. And uh, San Antonio is, has this in their water plan for the future in terms of supply. My personal opinion is that I think we're gonna see much of Central Texas at some point um, um, pulling water out of the Gulf of Mexico and desalinating it. Right now there isn't, except for, for San Antonio, but it, I personally think that's probably gonna change. Um, another source of water that you might not think about as a source of water is, uh, it's, it's called the one water cycle, but it's basically water from the built environment. Um, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about the urban environment, but really to me it's a built environment because you can use your home, for example, as a source of water. Uh, my wife and I here in Austin, in cent central Austin, uh, we have a 5,000 gallon rainwater harvesting tank that collects water off of our two car garage uh, that we use to um, do our outdoor watering. It's a zero escape yard because you can't collect enough rainwater. I mean, I shouldn't say that you could, but it costs you an arm and a leg. Can't collect enough rainwater to water grass. Um, grass takes an astounding amount of water. Um, and so we zero escape and use that um, so we don't use any city supply outdoors. Um, our um, um, water bill for, for uh, this month is probably gonna be about 25 bucks. Um, and I know there's uh, people irrigating their yards in our neighborhood that's gonna be several hundred dollars. Um, but so there's rainwater harvesting, uh, air conditioning condensates. Um, is another potential uh, source of supply. Um, there's a skyscraper downtown called the Austonian that um, harvests about 13,000 gallons a year to meet its landscaping needs of air conditioning condensate. And if you think about it, you know, when do you need the water? It's during the summer months. When's your air conditioning running? It's during the summer months. And so um, that becomes a, a urban or a built environment source of supply. Um, people aren't drinking this, although you could, you know, with the right treatment, you certainly um, could drink air conditioning condensate. And there are people that do drink um, rainwater, particularly like out in, out in the hill country. And again, it doesn't take much treatment. Um, storm water can be intercepted. Um, so overland flow um, on a property can be collected and, uh, and treated, and then, and then wastewater can be treated. Um, one of the folks I work with, Nick Dornack, he's like, he just does this every time I say wastewater, because he's like, it's not, it's not waste, um, because it's, it's, it's water, and with the right treatment, um, it, can be, it can be used again. Um, there's a lot of uh, what's called de facto reuse. Um, so, so for example, I don't, have you ever seen those memes? It's, it's like every glass of water you drank, at least one molecule passed through a dinosaur. Have you all seen those? Well, I like to tell my friends in Houston that uh, every glass you drink of Houston water, at least one molecule has passed through Jerry Jones. Um, <laughs> so um, the reason I say that is, is um, you know, the numbers suggest that about half the flow in the Trinity River is treated wastewater from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And in times of drought, that number kicks up to 80%. We call that de facto reuse. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not explicitly planned um, because that water is treated and then disposed of in the river. Um, but it flows downstream, and if there's someone else pulling water out of that river, well, they're, they're reusing the water um, from upstream. There's actually greater flows in the Trinity these days because there's interbasin transfers of water you know, for drinking water, but then it gets treated and discharged to the Trinity. So, um, but people are also getting very hands-on about that treatment. Um, I, I attended maybe two, three months ago. The city of Austin had a grand opening for their new permit center. And, uh, and they did something very cool, which is um, they have an on-site building scale wastewater treatment plant. It's in, a, it's a, it's in a, a, a box about the size of a shipping container, which a lot of hipsters call home these days. Um, 
so it's very small, it's real, it's real cute, has some kind of hydroponic things going on. Um, and, um, and so they take all the black water that comes out of the building, treat it, and then bring it back in for flushing the toilets and the uh, uh, urinals, um, thereby reducing that water footprint. So, so there's a lot of innovative things going on there. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the future use of, I'm sorry, um, the current use of water. Uh, this is uh, information from the Texas Water Development Board, which of course has a lot of great information on water resources of the state, is showing our, our use over time. And that purple bar on the bottom is, is municipal. And you'll notice that's actually pretty flat. Um, you know, some little ups and downs. Uh, 2011, you see it pop up because we had the driest one-year drought. Uh, the worst one-year drought in Texas was that year. Um, for the most part, it stayed pretty flat. And so, But meanwhile, population has boomed. I don't know about where you all live, but population has been like exploding here in central Texas. And so um, uh, kudos to water conservation programs and water efficiency programs to, to keep those numbers uh, relatively flat. And then irrigation, of course, is, continues to be a major user in Texas. A lot of that driven by uh, Ogallala Aquifer up in the High Plains, uh, Midland down through Lubbock area. And of course, it goes up and down depending on um, what's going on with the weather and droughts. Um, if, you, if we uh, take a look at surface water on the left and groundwater on the right, the uh, surface water, you can see most surface water is going towards municipal municipalities, um, but there's still about, um, about, so about half is going to cities, um, about a third is going to irrigation. Um, most groundwater, about three quarters, is going to um, irrigation. Um, and that's, in, in large part, that is uh, due to the Ogallala. The Ogallala, um, impolitely, I like to say, the Ogallala ruins everything. Um, and I don't mean that literally, but, but uh, it, it skews the numbers. So looking at this plot here, you know, so let's say, let's look at 2019, 14 million acre feet of water. Ogallala, uh, about five to six million acre feet is pumped from that single aquifer. Um, so that, that's what I mean by, you know, it kind of makes it hard to do a apples to apples uh, comparison. But, uh, but the truth is, is most of our groundwater is produced does go to agriculture. Uh, municipalities though, um, still about 20%, and really across the state, because um, groundwater is a distributed source and it's generally good quality. So even in East Texas, um, we see that. So let's talk about uh, future use. Um, so this is, um, sometimes you'll see these plots and it's just a single line showing um, future use of Texas and it goes up a little bit. Um, I like to show this plot because um, um, I think it tells a fuller story. And the reason when you add everything up together and it only goes up a little bit, despite our population increasing some 80% over the next 50 years, according to the state water plan, um, it's actually, our demand for municipal water is going up uh, almost one for one. Um, not quite, it's a little less because there's an expectation that uh, um, we'll, we'll be using more efficient fixtures that, that meet current state and federal requirements. Um, but the reason the overall value looks low is you'll see that blue line for irrigation is expected to come down. Um, and this is showing one and a half million acre feet. And again, this is the Ogallala. You know, there's, there's some conversion of irrigated land to municipal land, We're particularly seeing this down in the Lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, but, the, but the Ogallala, we're pumping in it at six times the rate it's coming back in. And it is uh, kind of drying out at the fringes and, and moving in. So, so in 50 years, I'm expecting to produce a lot less water going forward. Um, but the main, so the main point was just kind of explain what that chart is, but then also note that um, with every new Texan moving here from California, um, <laughs> you know, the, we're going to need more water for those folks. Um, and that's, that's a challenge for, for y'all and a challenge for all of us as we, as we march forward. Um, this is showing um, projected annual water demand in 2040, so in about 20 years. 
And as might be expected, um, you know, the Houston area, it's mostly municipal, Dallas-Fort Worth area, municipal. Um, but our major irrigation areas, um, see region A and O, that's what those are, regional water planning um, areas. It's mostly agriculture, and then the Lower Grande Valley down in Region M, also mostly agriculture. And then also Region E, too, mostly um, agriculture. So let's uh, choose your favorite region there. I've often wondered why there's a Region P. Um, my theory is it's because that's where Shiner Bach is brewed. Um, so somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so where, where's that water going to come from in the future according to the water plan? And of course, the water plan is, you know, each of those areas I showed you in that previous plot has planning groups um, represented by, uh, by locals that know the resources, know the needs, um, and know, know what it is that their people want in terms of supplies um, and what they're willing to do. And, um, and so surface water is expected to be um, most of those. Um, some of this is what I would call um, paper water because like if you have a contract with a river authority and that uh, goes away say in 2050, although this is, yeah, this is 2070, it goes away in 2050, you need to resign it, um, that'll, that'll show up here. Um, there's also some reservoirs that have been built but, but uh, not fully utilized and so somebody may be building a pipeline to it to tap into it. But there also continue to be um, new reservoirs proposed. Um, intriguing to me is something called off-channel reservoirs. Um, it's hard to build a reservoir in Texas. Um, really, it's hard to build a reservoir anyways. The environmental um, issues, there's uh, uh, private property right issues. Oftentimes, um, land is being condemned that has been in, in um, um, like 112th generation Texans or something like that. Um, you know, it's been in, you know, they were here when Texas was formed, their family was here, and, and now it's gonna be under a lake. And so, um, so there's, there's those issues. Texas, as you all know, is very supportive of private property rights. Um, Off-channel reservoirs, on the other hand, um, you know, a water provider can buy a big ranch, so it's a willing seller, willing buyer, there's no condemnation. You can build a ring dike, so you're off the main stem of the river. You avoid a lot of the environmental issues with building reservoirs on the main stem. And then during um, excess flows, during floods, you can then you know, have a pipeline that sucks water out of the river and sticks it in your off-channel reservoir, and then you can pull water out of the reservoir when you need it. So, so see more and more of those in the water plan. Lower Colorado River Authority has uh, one that they have uh, um, built um, downstream um, from Austin, so, so that's good. Uh, demand management's that light blue bar, so, so this is water conservation, uh, but then also drought restrictions. How many, how many of y'all um, work for utilities that are currently under drought restrictions? Yeah, as a number of y'all, not surprising with uh, how bad the drought has been. Um, and so, so that's part of that bar there, um, getting people to use less during drought to extend our current supplies. Um, Jerry Jones water is number three there, that reuse water. Um, you know, and it can be used for like purple pipe, um, so it can be used for irrigation instead of using your source water, which is a common, common use, but we're also um, seeing more interest in, in something called direct potable reuse, where it's being completely cleaned up and brought in to the distribution system um, for uh, delivery to customers. Um, the uh, um, um, Big Spring project is uh, uh, the, only the second one in the world, second to a project in Namibia, um, which started, if I remember right, in the 80s. Um, the third plant in the world was in Wichita Falls. It was an emergency plant due to that terrible drought in 2011 to 2015. Um, El Paso is building a huge direct potable reuse plant. And, uh, and I haven't gone in and looked at the plan, the updated plan that came out earlier this year. Uh, I know the previous plan was about three dozen small communities that were looking at doing direct potable reuse. Um, so um, I've gone to that Big Spring plant and uh, tried that water. Um, first, I made sure I was at the right end of the plant, um, <laughs> you know, and then, 
then, uh, you know, there was, honestly, there was a spigot there, and I got that water, and I, I drank it, and it was, it, was, it was really good, you know, a slight hint of beef enchiladas, but other than that, it was really good. <laughs> All right, it's a target-rich environment, and I love poop jokes. But, but, uh, but the water is water is 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 great. You know, we have the technology to completely clean it up. TCQ has worked um, diligently with these different communities to make sure that water is safe. And and I think as we go into a a, um, a need for more water in the future, we're probably going to see more of these as these plants come online. Um, all those wastewater treatment plants around the state, you know, they're, they're, they're springs in a way. Um, and so there are potential sources of water going forward. Groundwater comes in fourth. Um, you see seawater down there. And then aquifer storage and recovery, which is taking water from one source and storing it underground. Uh, conventionally, that's surface water. Um, but, uh, but it can be treated wastewater like El Paso is doing. Um, and, uh, and then the Edwards, I'm sorry, the uh, San Antonio water system is doing an aquifer to aquifer, um, aquifer storage and recovery. They're taking excess water from the Edwards aquifer and storing it into the Carrizo aquifer during good times and then pulling it out during droughts like they're doing, uh, presumably they're doing now. Um, so, so we're going to see, I think, more of that going forward. So sustainability. Um, been doing some, a bit of work on sustainability lately, and uh, I put this up here because this is a, a photo of 49ers from 1849, you know, that big rush west to go get gold. And, uh, and these dudes, and it might not have been actually these dudes, but dudes like this, um, you know, got into conflict with surface water and created something called prior appropriation. Um, which is like, like I got here first, and so I need to get my water before you get your water, and then your second, your third, et cetera. Um, and that's how Texas um, permits surface water in the state. Um, T and TCQ is in control of that, that permitting. Um, it's, you know, for what TCQ looks for, my understanding, I'm a little getting a little bit out of my comfort zone, but my understanding is that. Um, you know, for, for a city municipal supply, they're looking for one, I think what's called 100-100 water, that, that is 100% reliability that 100% of that water is going to be there. Um, so in other words, during a repeat of the drought of record, um, you're going to be able to get that supply. And, and that has turned out to be um, a good way of managing supplies or surface water supplies in a sustainable way. And we're almost forced to manage surface water sustainably because um, you get an almost an instantaneous kickback um, if, you, if you don't. In other words, you run out of water. Uh, it doesn't happen over decades like what's happening with the Ogallala Aquifer with, with its unsustainable pumping, but it might happen in a few years with a, with a reservoir. So that's why we talk about firm yields and, and droughts of record. Um, this is going to be a hard plot to look at, um, but it reminds me to talk about groundwater sustainability. Um, there's a report that I did for the Meadow Center uh, that you can get online. It talks about um, groundwater sustainability and where we're at in Texas. Um, and uh, the short story here is that um, if we look at all the aquifers except the Ogallala, uh, what a former boss of mine called the Ogly Ugly. Um, but, and without the Ogallala, um, you know, we're currently pumping those um, um, in a sustainable way, um, but we're planning to pump those about twice the sustainable rate going forward. And so what that means is that you know, many of the aquifers, you know, we'll see water levels um, either continue to go down every year or start going down every year um, as we march forward. Um, and so, uh, so you can kind of pick your favorite aquifer here or download that report to, to learn more to kind of see what the status is because um, you know some of them looks like the future will be sustainable but others um, maybe not so much so and so um, and there's a kind of a big long history there but part of the reason for doing this work was just to kind of look at what the situation is in Texas because we used to as a state worry about groundwater sustainability um, and then uh, um, nobody's fault, but, uh, but with the redirection of water planning from state-focused to region-focused, it, it kind of just fell out of the car. 
um, you know, Sister Sue just plopped out and what you know, family went off on vacation. It's like, where's Sue? It's the same sort of thing. Where's groundwater sustainability? Um, so I'm like, hey, you dropped the baby. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, I've, I've heard some folks talk about, none of you, of course, but heard some folks talk about, gosh, you know, direct potable reuse. Um, we can create an infinite water machine. Um, anybody watch that terrible Kevin Costner movie, Waterworld? Um, <laughs> start it off, you know, we can, we can create an infinite water machine. Um, but it, but it doesn't work that way. Um, part of the reason is, is there's water losses. Um, probably by the, by the end of the day, if you're doing a direct potable reuse plant with treated wastewater, you're probably getting a 50% recovery. And so with water reuse, um, your resiliency is only good as your source supply. And so if your lake goes dry and you got no water for your water reuse plant, your water reuse plant goes dry and it happens pretty quickly. Um, water reuse can help keep more water in the lake, um, but you just got to hope that you're not a evaporation dominated system, um, which we certainly see with the lakes in the western half of the state. Um, so you, you know, maybe you buy yourself a few days, a few weeks, um, but still when the lake goes dry, your water reuse plant goes dry. You know, drought, same thing with drought restrictions. These are, these are good things, don't get me wrong, but um, what concerns me is sometimes people think, well, if I do this and do this, then we're resilient. Um, you're only as resilient as your source supply, and so you really need to be looking at your source supply. Um, the, uh, also for the future, um, um, seawater desalination. Um, you know, part of this is informed by, like I kind of see, like the Carrizo Wilcox is getting a lot of well fields being put in to support growth in Central Texas. And uh, I don't believe that's gonna be sustainable pumping. And it winds up being a, what I would call a bridging supply to, to seawater desalination. We'll see what the future holds. Um, but I was quoted in a book saying that the Gulf of Mexico helps me sleep at night when I worry about Texas water issues. And, uh, and, and we are fortunate to uh, have it nearby. You know, Las Vegas is looking at, for example, seawater desalination. They're a long ways away. They're also looking at the Mississippi. Um, um, so future trends. I um, have to be careful here when I talk about this stuff. but. Um, it's been getting hotter lately. I've been in Texas since 91. Um, I came from New Mexico via Illinois. And, uh, um, and it was a lot pleasanter back then. Um, it just seems like things are getting warmer. And John Nielsen Gammon, the state climatologist, has been carefully mapping this stuff. And, uh, and indeed, um, temperatures have been getting warmer. And, Temperatures going up is a big deal. That is like a big driver for our water resources in the state. Um, it's, it increases evaporation from soils, increases evapotranspiration. So our soils are gonna dry up quicker and dry up more um, between rainfall events. So we're gonna get uh, presumably less runoff and then also probably less recharge to boot. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the states is, I don't know, um, half a degree to three quarters of a degree Fahrenheit per decade. Doesn't seem like much, um, but it doesn't take much. Um, there's a, you know, there's some, here's some plots showing different regions of the state and the average annual number of 100 degree days. You know, my mom called me up on, uh, on Sunday and we chatted and she's like, you know, how are you, how are you making it through those 100 degree temperatures? I'm like, I'm just sitting inside with a beer, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. <laughs> Um, I grew up in northern Illinois. It's just like, you know, you just sat inside when it was awful outside during the winter. So, um, but, you know, I've, I've also, you know, friends on Facebook, you know, a AC systems going out. And, and uh, that just seems horrific um, in, uh, in this heat. But, but there's also an expectation that, you know, we're going to see more of these severely hot days. And, you know, we do get these situations of, uh, you know, high pressure system sitting over Texas like we have now, and there's a feedback loop that uh, reinforces itself. It's hot, it's dry, and it reinforces that high pressure system. I mean, there's some crazy, I don't know if you saw them, some crazy rainfall maps where 
It's like the outline of Texas, no rain, and everybody else around us is getting rain. Um, the, uh, there, there has been an um, increase in parts of the state of precipitation trends. So this is a percent increase per decade. Of course, we all know about the multiple storms that have hit uh, the Houston area. Um, but we've also seen uh, increases um, here in, in Austin and in the Hill Country, um, including down in the lower Grande Valley and interestingly enough out in El Paso. Um, but of course, you know, if you roll down the window and spit out the window, you've probably increased their rainfall 10%. But, um, um, and, then, and then a lot of West Texas, if anything, there's like a hint of uh, pink in there, so there might even be a decrease. Um, and then this is some projections that uh, Nielsen Gammon made, and it's showing PDSI, which is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, so it's a measure of drought conditions. The horizontal dashed line is showing um, the, you know, average, and so when you're above that line, you're wetter than normal, you're out of drought, below it, you're in drought. Um, the upper one showing West Texas, the lower one for East Texas, they both look pretty similar, although West Texas looks a bit more severe. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if I believe these results, even though I'm a co-author on this paper. I um, also, also, <laughs> also don't know if, uh, if I'm, uh, I just don't want to believe these results. Now, this is, uh, I will note that uh, this is RCP 8.5, which is a pretty severe condition. Um, almost nobody thinks this will happen, but maybe something half of, of what this line is happening. And it's suggesting that you know maybe 2100, um, under more realistic conditions, we might be in kind of more permanent drought-like conditions in the state. Um, and um, certainly we're seeing, you know, everyone's heard about the Colorado, the other Colorado River. We were first, we were the first Colorado River. Um, I talked with uh, somebody who was talking about that Colorado River and he was offended <laughs> when I pointed that out. But um, that other Colorado River has, uh, you know, we're all hearing the struggles that it's having. And it was a drought that started in the late 90s and continues to this day. Um, I don't know if anybody here is a mega death fan, but I just love it when I hear the term mega drought because that's a technical term for these long multi-decadal droughts that we've seen from tree ring data going in the past. Um, but th there's a mega drought going on out there. And I would argue that uh, the western parts of the state are um, feeling um, or part of that, that mega drought because because drought conditions started in the far west and uh, I'd say even through the Panhandle region um, in uh, the late 90s. And, and we're kind of on the fringes of it, so it kind of ebbs in and out, but, but uh, I kind of feel like, you know, and then there's discussion is that, when is it not drought? When is it like the new condition? Time will tell, because um, time is data. Uh, we shall see, but uh, something to consider. So solutions. As I wrap up, um, I have no idea why I want, I kind of like this, because it's creepy. Um, but, <laughs> and uncertainty can be creepy, but, but my advice is embrace the uncertainty. You know, we, we plan on drought of record. Um, state water planning does allow for regional water planning groups to build in safety factors into their current supplies. Um, and I, I would recommend that you do that. Um, you know, setting aside what's happening in terms of uh, um, today and in the future, perhaps with our climate, um, you go look at the past uh, and then you look at tree rings, we've had far worse droughts than we've had today. So if you're able to build in resiliency for having um, less supply than under um, drought of record conditions strong, strongly suggests that, that you do that. That's a useful tool. Um, I'm a philosophical stoic. I'm an accidental stoic. And, and stoics think about the worst possible scenario, which sounds like a miserable way to live, but it's actually quite liberating. So you just think about what happens if this happens? Um, what happens if that happens? And how would we respond? And, and you know, maybe it's an interconnect. You know, maybe maybe you advance up some of your strategies in the plan to get them online earlier, in case we uh, have a drought worse than the drought of record, which some people experience in the in the uh, um, 2011 to 2015 drought. And it looks like South Central Texas is currently in a new drought of record. 
Um, so um, it's not uncommon for us to be experiencing those things. Um, this one water um, approach, uh, this is another example, uh, Wimberley One Water School, the first one water school in Texas. Uh, they collected rainwater, air conditioning, condensate. They use clear pipes. It's an elementary school, and so you know kids love seeing the, um, and and I love seeing the water coming down those clear pipes when it rains. Uh, they have an on-site treatment and reuse system, and then they use that um, treated water to water the grounds, and it's reducing the use of the Trinity Aquifer by 90 percent. And get this, it's going to save the money, uh, estimated at almost a million dollars over the next 30 years. Um, so, so you know, looking at my crystal ball, I think we're going to see more of more stuff like this happening um, to reduce water footprints going forward. Um, you've heard me prattle on about um, uh, um, seawater desal, so I think that's I think we'll see more of that in future water plans. Aquifer storage and recovery is a great way to kind of store water away from the ravages of evaporation um, and, and save it for a dry day to pull out later. Um, San Antonio has had immense success with that, and we're seeing a number of communities along I-35, including Austin, looking at doing that to uh, help uh, firm up their water. Um, Conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water. You know, we can learn a lot about West Texas and far West Texas. I mentioned that you know they may be part of that mega drought in the American Southwest, and they've been having to do some things they didn't think they'd ever have to do. And so the, for example, the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority, these are the folks that uh, were buying their own groundwater. They also wound up buying Boone Pickens groundwater. Um, they're based on Lake Meredith, but when the lake dries up, which it did during the 2011 to 2015 drought, um, they can go 100% groundwater, but then when they have surface water, they can conserve their groundwater and use their, their um, surface water instead. Um, I call that pure conjunctive. You can kind of switch back and forth. Um, El Paso does something similar with its groundwater resources in the Rio Grande. So to conclude, um, I uh, told you all about kind of where all the water goes. You can blame the battle sun and evaporation for, for stealing 86% of our, of our water. Um, um, and so most of the rain goes, rain that doesn't evaporate goes to surface water and a little bit going to groundwater. I showed you kind of what our current use of water is. Um, on, on, on balance, it's about 55% groundwater, 45% surface water, and those numbers get closer every year, so at some point it will be a surface water dominated state. Um, sustain a, a future use, um, you know, still banging on the surface water, um, but we see um, in, in conventional supplies, but we're seeing drought management and reuse uh, picking up. Um, we talked about sustainability, you know, for the most part we manage surface water sustainably, groundwater not so much so um, for the future. And then, um, you know, it looks like we're going to have some more challenges going forward with our water resources, particularly surface water resources and our responsive aquifers like the Edwards Aquifer. And some, some solutions, I'm sure there's more, I'm sure there's lots of great ideas in this room. Um, and, uh, and finally, um, for those of you on day six of no brisket, I haven't seen the lunch menu, but I do hope brisket's on the menu for you. We want to keep you around this afternoon. Thank you. I don't think there's time for questions. So. Thank you for an entertaining presentation, Dr. Mace.